Good afternoon, Tammy. Hi. So our first question is sometimes you make a distinction between essay and porn addiction. Can you please explain? Sure. Um, you know, I used to working with sex addiction for such a long time. I absolutely thought, well, what's the difference? Sex is sex. And we treated it that way in the beginning, talked about it, I don't treat it, but well, we might have treated it that way in the beginning too. But the porn addicts themselves came out very strongly and said, wait a minute, we're not like those other people. And they're right, because sex addicts are having sex with all kinds of people. They're out there in massage parlors and online picking people up and hooking up and all that stuff. And porn addicts are home looking at porn. And so when you have a porn addict who goes to a sex addiction meeting, they say, well, wait a minute, that sounds like stuff I'd like to do, but all I do is sit at home at ho alone in isolation, and, and my only relationship isn't even with a, someone I pay, it's with the computer. So I think they're right. I think that they have different needs and they have different um, structure that requires them, you know, they need to go out and connect with people. I think uh, sex addicts need to stay home a little more. So yes, they are different populations, but I really think the issue underneath is the same. Um, the sense of loneliness, the emptiness, the the early tra trauma issues. I mean, they're, they're sim. I don't want to say that differently. I think for the most part, they're the same. I think there are some young people who simply get hooked on the porn and it becomes easier than relating to young people or, you know, it just becomes their go-to, but that's different than the way I think about addiction. That feels more like if they put the computer down and start engaging in life, they would, and I've seen this, it's no longer addictive for them. So it's really more of a stepping stone, whereas for addicts, you're got it your whole life. So. Well, and, you know, and I want to speak a little bit to the partners because I hear from partners, you know, of porn addicts that they don't like they feel like they've been less betrayed, you know, even though like he's completely, I'm using he and she, but you know, even though he's completely disengaged from life and the family and everything else, cause he's stuck in his porn, you know, putting his yeah. job at risk, you know, whatever. Um, but they feel like, well, it's not as bad as if he acted out with another person. And I'm like, but betrayal is betrayal. And, you know, and if it's not agreed to as part of your relationship, it's still cheating. So, so yes, there are nuances to all of that and unpacking it, but, but still at the end of the day, like you said, I call it the hole in the soul. There's, there's something, you know, that, that we're looking to fill with whatever it is or escape or whatever. And, and a betrayed partner is still a betrayed partner. So looking for the commonalities of here's where we can relate rather than, oh, it's different than, you know, I, I think can be helpful. So, well, I want to say something about that since you brought up partners, um, because and I've said this before, but people who go through the treatment program and seeking integrity, you know, they're there for three weeks or something like that. And their spouses are asked to send a this person, you know, what has it like living with this person and how has your behavior affected me? And it's interesting because I read these letters and, you know, they're very hard for everyone to hear. Of course, there are things that you've said before, but no one was listening. But nonetheless, one of the, if I had to tell you what 95% of those letters are about. It's not about sex. 95% of those letters is not you cheated with this person, you cheated with that person. You did 95% of those letters is you've been distant. You've been unavailable. You haven't included me. You have this whole other life. I don't feel like I'm connected. In other words, the whole thing really comes down to disconnection, lack of trust. That's the deeper pain. And so whether it's porn, as I'm agreeing with you, Tammy, whether it's porn or whether you're out there in the world, it's the same to the spouse on some level because you're getting ignored. Your family's not being engaged. That person you need to be there isn't there. Um, and they have all kinds of excuses what's really going on and they're lying. So, you know, from the spouse's perspective, I agree, Tammy, the, the essence of what you want your partner to bring to recovery is the same. And so they're like, just so everybody's on the same page, if you can put all the questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, it helps me follow through and track them. So um, I don't pay attention to what's in the chat. I will put like if Dr. Rob recommends a book or something like that, I will put that in the chat. Um, but if any questions in the Q&A and that will help. So, okay, next question. I've been wondering if you can talk about the benefits of doing 90 days of celibacy. It's an interesting question because, um, first of all, there's this whole myth in my field uh, about 
well, 30 days is this, but if you do 90 days, it's that. And, you know, the brain resets itself. And, you know, that's all a bunch of hooey. I mean, it just, that's a bunch of people guessing at things that they don't really understand. Um, the reality is um, your brain doesn't reset. It doesn't all of a sudden, we're not talking about I don't know, alcohol, where after 90 days or so, your brain starts to come back to reality because you haven't been soaking it. This is different. You know, this is a chronic long-term problem. You have it whether you're acting out or not. So um, I, I do think that there are benefits to celibacy. I wouldn't call it celibacy. I would call it abstinence. Um, celibacy is something that, you know, priests do and stuff like that. Abstinence is I'm taking a period of time and I'm not engaging at this. Celibacy is a lifestyle. But anyway, whatever you choose to call it. Um, uh, my sponsor years ago asked me to take 90 days and then I had to take another 90 days. <laughs> so I spent six months not being sexual. Oh, that's kind of embarrassing, but it's true. And I'll tell you what I got out of it and what I didn't. What I got out of it was that I was going to survive, that it wasn't really my most important need, that there were other ways to feel pleasure, to engage with people, to feel value. Just there were other ways I could meet my needs, even if they were um, difficult ones. And most of all, I learned who I could be in the world without constantly looking for someone to uh, desire sexually or someone who I wanted to notice me or flirtation or this whole like exterior that I had developed um, and lived in in order, the goal of which was to bring people toward me for sex, um, I had to put all that down. So what I wore, how I talked to people, how long I looked them in the eye, like everything changed because there was no intent of going and being sexual. So for me, rediscovering who I was on a variety of levels was really fantastic in terms of taking uh, a period of abstinence because I'd been having very active sex and I'm talking about me, it isn't you, but you know, it, it may be helpful. I was very active at 14. You know, so by my mid 20s, when I really started looking at this, you know, it was important for me to figure out who I was if I wasn't constantly in that rat wheel of, of, uh, of seduction, let's say. But I can tell you what I did not get out of out of uh, uh, six months of celibacy or 90, sorry, six months abstinence. of abstinence. And the reason that I know this is the same reason that I don't generally refer people, uh, single people to S.A., sexaholics anonymous is that i didn't it didn't teach me how to date it didn't teach me how to get close to people in a romantic way it didn't teach me how to approach sexuality in a healthy way so i learned how to stop and i learned a lot about me in the stopping but what i don't think it's a benefit of is learning how to have healthy intimacy healthy sexuality you have to go out there and practice that so i learned a lot about stopping it's like sort of silly but i didn't learn a lot about going in a, in a certain way so anyway that's that's the the bulk of it um anything tammy you're in yeah i do because you said i rediscovered myself and i was like i bet you discovered yourself i, well, I bet it was you, you know i because i think you know we at a young age learn maladaptive coping mechanisms and so so we don't really find ourselves until we're willing to you know to stop engaging in things that are you know distract us from having to deal with the the reality of emotions and uncomfortable feelings and you know learn that we will not die from being uncomfortable you know so i that was my only take was that i mean i agree with you 100 percent. and i have heard it so long you know i used to hear that your brain resets after 90 days and it was like this magic so on 91 days your brain is all reset and which right. is so not the case so. and it's bad for the spouses too because yes. then you think okay it's been 90 days you're going to be different and yes. no, we're not. We may have well, stopped. And it's 90 days. And now you have to have sex with me, even if you don't trust me, you know, like, because now it's 90 well, yeah, days. Well, yeah, because my brain know? reset. Yes. Um, let me, I'm going to move my fan because it's warm here, but I'm listening. Okay. You tell me the next okay. question. I'm the right next here. question then is, if sex with my essay brings up intrusive thoughts of him with other women, is it too soon to engage or will that fade away naturally? Four months post discovery and tons of growth since then. That's awesome to yeah. hear. Um, Great but what question. are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I, I think we would have the same thoughts, which is it's very early. Four months post disclosure is still, in my experience, trauma time. You're still trying to figure out which way is up and how did this happen and how long has this been going on? And, you know, and now that I know, what does it mean? You know, it's it's it is the time to be a mess. And so to to question yourself about um, wanting to power through your discomfort, I don't think is the right question. I say the other way, can you respect your body? Can you respect your mind? Your mind is telling you. 
everything you need to know, which is I'm not ready for this. I don't trust the situation. It reminds me of how I was hurt before. So that, that answers your own question. You don't need me. All you need to do is trust yourself. I also encourage you, if you haven't been to any of the support groups that we offer, we don't charge for them. Um, a lot of betrayed partners are there and they will, they'll talk about you know, how they feel when they're approached by the addict for sex. Or um, I, I will tell you this though, and we talk about this a lot. When you talk about, what's the word? Uh, I, want, I want the word. Uh, doing substance to thoughts. Yeah, intrusive right, sex. thoughts that was with the him. Word. Yes, it yes. was the second word. Sex. Oh, okay. There are a lot of things you can do other than have. You know, and what is sex? Is really my question. Is it penetrative? You know, to orgasm kind of thing, or is it the beginning of growing intimacy that might lead towards sex? In other words, trust your body to say, you know, I really like when we're holding hands. I really like when we're smooching. I really like when we're spooning in bed. I really like when he or she gives me a massage. I love it when we're out laughing together and doing fun things. Those are intimate. All of that lays a foundation for sexuality. So when, are you ready? Are you far enough along where you could hold hands, where you could have a date, where you could smooch, where you could, you know, begin to engage in sensual and intimate experiences that, you know, in healthy people who've been together a while leads towards sex. Um, so I would be a little concerned about if it was my partner, uh, and I don't know if you're getting pressure, but um, I would really not want, if I were you, to have any influence about whether I should be sexual or whether it's right to be sexual or whether I'm going to help you with your recovery. You know, you have to trust your body. And it is a consequence to us that we don't just get to have sex when we want to with you or anyone else. Um, that is part of our growth process. Um, so even when you feel like having sex with us, it's not a great idea. And I'll say it a thousand times. Why would you have sex with someone you don't trust? And I don't care who it is in your life and your body and your mind is telling you too soon. I don't trust, you know, I, I hate to say it out, but you know, eight months, six months, you know, depending on what kind of work you're doing and what actually happened. And I've heard people, sorry, addicts, not have sex for a year. I've heard people who were ready in six months. It's really very individual. There's no kind of, uh, there's no uh, timeline. That we, your brain doesn't reset. <laughs> right. I, I, and I, I love that I'm hearing tons of growth since then. I mean, that's fantastic. But I, I agree with Dr. Robin was thinking the same thing. It's like, start slow. What, you know, the sensate focused um, touch, other non penetrative, you know, sexual touch or um, just connection touch, you know, what is going to feel good. But I, I think really listen to your body. Um, if you're, if you are doing some trauma work, you, you know, that may be something that's good for you as well. Some EMDR brain spotting, somatic experience, something, you know, that helps you process through some of the trauma, not that it's your fault, you know, but just another tool that may be useful to you. But I, you know, I think you'll know when you're ready. So. So the next question, how do I know if he's genuinely in recovery? I feel like he's not putting forth the effort and placing other things first. I am here by myself because he had something else going on. It's always something else. I think that's your answer. So, Yeah, I mean, go ahead, Tammy. I think you you, you got this one down. Yeah, well, it's one, it's one of those where, you know, if it, uh, oh, what? Oh, shoot. I lost the, 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 there's a saying that we talk about. Yeah. Oh, anything that we put in front of our recovery, um, it, we will lose, you know, it's, it's like, if I put my job in front of my recovery, I'll lose much. I mean, what Dr. Rob will fire me, you know how it'll be. So it's one of those things where I'll lose. I'm kidding. I, I'll lose everything. If I don't keep my recovery as the prime focus, because I know for sure addiction is just waiting, you know, in the wings and, you know, my, convoluted thinking so so you know we never you know have recovery so so good that you know, we just can ignore it you know I still and I've shared this before I still do a recovery meditation in the morning because it's one of those things where I just want to start my day in the right way I still I was traveling you know I went to multiple you know, uh, in-person 12-step meetings met some great new friends I've got you know a new home group anytime I go to that that town. So, so it's one of those things doing that recovery work has got to be, and particularly very early in my recovery, like that was, that was my job. I did that first. So what are you firing me? Sorry. <laughs> <You're fired. laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. To, uh, well, I'm going to sign questions. off now, folks. So yeah, I'm just kidding. 
I wanted to uh, respond to this too, because you said something at the beginning, like, uh, I think you've answered your own question. I think Tammy said that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, this is certainly worth repeating. Um, um, how do I say, I want to say this. Um, trust is restored by healthy behaviors and actions. This, this is division, okay? Healthy, healthy behaviors and actions over time. That's how you restore trust. So it doesn't matter. You want to see genuine? Do you see this person committed to the healing process? Are they coming to you and saying, I, you know, I'm, I'm just beginning to figure out what a mess I've made of things. Are they, um, are they being less defensive? Are they listening to you? Are, are you? are they fine with your, sorry, are they fine being accountable to you for wherever they go, whenever they go? I mean, I see nothing wrong. You know, my phone has a tracker. It tells my spouse or anybody else, well, anybody who signed in where I am at that particular moment. I would want to feel like I could do that with my spouse. So I don't think that we know. I think they have to prove it to us. Um, they have to first prove it to themselves, but then you will feel and see. It's about commitment. I was very committed to having sex with lots and lots of people and keeping it a secret for a very long time. Um, this is the opposite. This is, I'm very, very committed to healing and I'm gonna do a lot of it. And if I, if you care about it, you're gonna see me doing it. So it's always, uh, I'll say one more time, trust is restored by um, right actions, honesty and right actions over time. There. Well, and, you know, and, and like, it, it, if the if you had discussed this is what we're going to do tonight so that we can talk about it afterwards and he bailed on it but what i really heard was you know it's always something else like you know if this was a single isolated thing whatever you know but it's always something else so and he's prioritizing always something else over right. you and recovery and what's good right. for the two of you and your relationship so i'm sorry i'm really sorry so yeah, this is not a good thing. And even no. that you're asking this question, I think you already know the answer. And the real question is, can you get his attention? You know, and maybe, you know, you need to ask him to sleep in another room. Maybe you need to ask him to sleep in another house. <laughs> maybe, you know, um, it is an absolute truth that no human, well, human beings will get off the dime for love or fear or, uh, or pain. But addicts generally only get off the dime if we're in pain. Um, because we are getting so much out of what we do, we think that um, it's very, very painful. Uh, we, we don't want to stop doing what we're doing. That's why we hide it and keep it a secret. So if you make us uncomfortable enough, it isn't, by the way, you can't do this for us. If you think, well, if I move out, if I change locks, whatever, then he or she will do that. Who knows what we're going to do? But what makes you feel safe? If someone isn't in genuine recovery, do you want them in your bed? If someone is, still has something else out there going on, do you want them in your house? I mean, these are decisions that you can make based on your own safety, um, but it doesn't sound like you're feeling safe. So I would start thinking about, rather than what he's doing, take the eye off of him and say, how can I make myself feel safer, more comfortable? What situations, people, places do I need to put me and him in so that I can feel more at peace? I won't be happy, but that I can feel safe and, whether he's making an effort or not. So to me, this sounds like a lot of lying, uh, a lot of trying to pull the wall over your eyes and you know it. And the question is, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. And, and boundaries are for your safety. It's not punitive. Right. I say this all the time. It's not you're being bad, you know? And so therefore it's like for my safety, for my own sanity, for me, I need to, you know, create this safe space. And it may, I, I don't feel comfortable with you sleeping in my, you know, in my bed. So you, you get the other room and I'm mean, whatever it is that you need for you is, um, you know, I'd encourage that. So, okay. Next question. My partner is a sex and porn addict and he is currently struggling a lot. He wants to go on a 30 day period of celibacy, which I thought was a good idea. However, now that he is entirely without his former coping mechanism, he projects his anger on me, which has resulted in him breaking up last week, claiming he thinks he never love me and might be a love addict it came out of the blue and didn't seem to make much sense however he has contact now and wants to get back in three weeks he claimed he has talked to his therapist about it and fellows to me it seems like he is projecting his anger and frustration on me i guess my question is what do what to do in this time and how to handle the situation well this sounds like a mess but 
Um, yeah. Tammy, why don't you start? Or if you want to feed me specific, I mean, there's like five questions in here. So if you want to throw some out. Well, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, this is somebody, uh, and I say this all the time. So, so really, because, you know, the just stopping without having a whole bunch of support and tools is the worst place to be in. Because like you're saying, you know, uh, like all of the, my coping mechanisms that I was using, maladaptive coping mechanisms, I'm not using that, but I don't have the life skills and tools to be able to do things in a positive way. You know, and I, I appreciate that you said, he says, you know, so you kind of are questioning, you know, because his actions are anger and you know, uh, you know, flames at you rather than, gosh, I really need to go do this work on myself. Um, uh, so the love addict, you know, Dr. Rob can talk about the difference. It, it, regardless of the label, I mean, at the end of the day, he's got you know, sex addiction, intimacy disorders, and he needs to work on himself. If he's seeing his therapist once a week, that isn't enough. You said he's got fellows. So I'm kind of assuming that's a 12 step of something. Is he doing the steps? Is he, you know, going to meetings at least once a day? Is he working with a sponsor at least, you know, daily having a check-in? You know, then it starts to, you know, to help. We have a treatment program. That's what we do. Like we have a treatment program for men like him that, you know, that, it, like, you know, that are, you know, in, they don't have the foundation that are trying to stop, but don't have the tools to be able to do that. You know, that's what we can help them um, you know, have a foundation of recovery on which to build and a plan, you know, uh, when they leave us, you know, for rebuilding that in a pro-dependent way. So they aren't blaming partners and spouses for their problematic behaviors. So, so Dr. Rob. I think there's something still going on that you don't know about. That's what I think. I think there's someone that you're involved with who's going in and out of their recovery and struggling with some behavior or belief or concept. Yeah, it's started to stop. And yes, we have a lot of feelings. And yes, we may get angry at you. But you know, usually we're able to somehow sort out what belongs to you and what belongs to me. Um, I don't think I would say I never loved you. Or um, I think I never loved you. I mean, that's not, that's just, that's, um, that's awful. How could you ever come back from that? So here's, I have actually a concrete suggestion for the situation. And then I have something I want to read. Um, to the group, very concrete suggestion. I would not move forward to this relationship without a couple's counselor. This is a situation where you really do need to sit in the same room with a professional. Could even be your husband's or boyfriend's or partner's therapist if you wanted, if they were willing to let you go in. Um, but you might wanna, I suggest a neutral person because I don't want you to feel like anyone's taking sides. But this is confusing. I would be confused. It doesn't make sense. I agree with you. But I wouldn't want to move toward this situation unless I had some clarity about our boundaries and what we were going to move into. And I certainly, if you think about this partner you have has going one way, going the other way, going, you know, do you really want to rely on that person to decide what's best for you and the two of you, um, at least without somebody there to say, mm, I don't think so. I got to tell you that one of my best experiences and most awful experiences was truly being in love with someone many, many years ago. And I think they wanted to break it off with me and I just didn't really believe it. And they were passive aggressive. So they were showing they didn't want to be with me, but on the surface, it was kind of wonderful. And we had to go to therapy to straighten this out. I had to say in therapy, are you with me or are we not? Are we together? Because if we're together, we're doing this. If we're not together and the therapist, thank goodness. And then my spouse, by the way, said to me, there you go again, looking for, you know, looking to get everything said and, and the way you want it. And, and Thank God the therapist said, the therapist said to me, no, actually he has a right to ask, are you in or are you out? And I would never have gotten to that point without that neutral person. I would have fallen right on the ground with my, my partner saying, well, there you go again. And I would have thought, oh gosh, there I go again. So I, having that, that neutral person in the room who knows or has listened to each of you and can give some very clear, I mean, that's, that's what we do. <laughs> that's our job as therapists and hopefully in treatment. Um, but I did want to read something because something you said about boundaries. So, you know, Tammy, I've been working on on a revised version of Prodependence, which will be out this summer. And we just had a version for all your therapists that came out last week, I think. And uh, so I'm very excited. I, I, my head is very much in Prodependence because my last two books are one for therapists and one for you guys that was revised. So I was reading and writing about boundaries. And this is what is in the book. So this is in Prodependence. Um, I don't usually read, but I'm going to read today. 
Um, this is related to a woman who um, she's trying to get her husband to change his behavior and not the interaction that she wants to have. And in her protecting him and pushing him and trying to understand him, she felt like she was in a prison with him. So this is what I did. And it's a, I complimented on her fortitude for sticking in the relationship despite the problem of addiction. Then we talked about how tiring and emotionally draining this whole situation is. Eventually, I suggested that there may be better and more effective and less draining ways for you to care for her to care the person she loved, and that would involve setting boundaries. And to this, she said, as many loved ones do, I've done that. I've set boundaries. He's broken them over and over again. It just doesn't work. He won't change his behavior just because I set a boundary. And I smiled. And I said, because loved ones of addicts often seem to think that setting boundaries is about putting limits on the addict's behavior. And inevitably, they've learned is everyone who's tried to control the behavior of another person who's over the age of 12, uh, that that doesn't work. Because other people don't want to be controlled by us any more than we want to be controlled by them. This means that caregivers must focus on their own behavior, not the addicts, when looking at the boundaries they need in their relationships I explained this basic to the client using my favorite analogy for boundaries. The analogy is that healthy boundaries are about staying in our own hula hoop. <laughs> you ever been a hula? That's kind of a dated thing, but nonetheless, you stay inside of there. So um, if the problem is not of our own making, then it is probably not, not ours to control and fix. The best thing we can do is to fix ourselves. Now that's not a codependency thing like, you know, uh, I've been enabling and I need to, it's not about the other person at all or their addiction or whatever they're gonna do. It's about you. And this has come up the second time here. What can you do to keep yourself safe? What can you do to make yourself feel good? And in, if in the process, you know, systems change things. If you pull back, if you focus on yourself, if you ask this person to distance, guess what? They may just decide that that's not how they like to be with you and they wanna work on themselves, but it wouldn't be because you change things to push them. It would be you change things because that's what feels safe to you. So anyway, I, that was long, Tammy, but I hope- No, that was I know super was helpful. helpful. Yeah, no, it was. And yeah, cause one of the things I also noted was, and he wants to get back in three weeks. So like, just like you're saying, right. he's, you know, like, you know, and, and what is that about? Like in three weeks, he's magically gonna, you know, be different or I, I don't know that. But that felt it feels like, like this. Exactly. Like, go away, come yeah, here. Yes, go away, yeah, come yes. here. Yeah, yeah. But to, to that would point, make me I crazy. often yeah, I often Sorry. hear partners that go, I've set up boundaries and you know, he pushes right through them. I was like, Well, they're not really a boundary if they're a sieve. You know, if you can right. like a calendar just go right on through, it's not, you know, it doesn't help create the safety for the partner you know, either. And, you know, people are like, what are good boundaries? And I was like, every, you know, the challenge is there's not like a list of you do these five things. And then those are your boundaries. It, it's like a recovery plan for an addict. Everybody's has to be different and nuanced. That's going to help that particular person. So working with a qualified professional, when you're talking about a couples therapist, somebody who gets addiction, because otherwise, you know, addicts are highly manipulative and can you know, railroad right over people. So, so making sure if you're getting help with a professional, it's someone who understands these issues, you know, to help, you know, support and guide the process. And a couple's one more thing, the couple's therapist, if you go see someone, the relationship is the client, not either one of you, it's the relationship. So there's very distinct differences between a couple's therapist, you know, and someone supporting a partner and somebody supporting an addict. So. Hey, Tammy, have we, and yeah. I should know this, but have we started the Betrayed Partners uh, Education Group online? Yeah, um, the work group. Yeah, and then we've got another yeah. one on June for, we've got a new group. Yeah, so we're well underway the reason, with the Betrayed Partner work group on seeking integrity, but um, but the next group will start June 1st. Really good content, so. The reason I bring that up is because we have, you know, reasonably low cost, I think they're low cost trainings online. And for the addicts, it really fills in those pieces that they don't get in therapy because they need to understand the addiction. They need to understand relapse prevention. They need to understand, you know, how, where it came from. And those are things that are not laid out in a particularly educational way. Therapy is more about feeling. Um, I think you also, especially in treatment center, we always give lectures almost every day. So um, that's why we have the 
uh, the, the series for the addicts and we have one for porn addicts and we have one for sex addicts, but we also have a series for betrayed partners. And the reason I bring all that up is because there's a whole session on boundaries and partners are sitting there getting educated getting supported. We have, there's a workbook I think that goes with it or there's on, it's on the way um, so that you can look at and yes. practice and not just hear, oh, you need better boundaries, but we're actually teaching that. And this is the same thing that the partners need, which you need education. Is it about me? What is addiction? How does that work? What is, mm -hmm. when should we be sexual again? I mean, all the questions you're asking, there's a reason why we set this program up. So June 1st, we'd love you to join um, because I think it really is a, plus you're not alone. You're with all these other spouses who are asking questions and taking the course at the same time. So I really do recommend it. Um, I'm not, you know, nothing to sell here, but I think it will help answer a lot of these questions for spouses who, you know, they're pretty black and white kinds of questions. Oh, I want to say one more thing, Tammy, about boundaries. You know, we talked about how they're specific to different situations. Mm -hmm. There are some boundaries that are universal. Someone's hitting you. Correct. Someone's enforcing you into sex. Someone's breaking things and yelling and screaming around you or your kids that's a not acceptable boundary the, you know anything that uh you could call the department of children's services for or the domestic violence division and have them come investigate is a boundary you don't want to blow through i have clients in treatment and have had clients in treatment who are realizing they have been really abusive in their marriages and relationships it never occurred to them that their own kids were seeing them scream and yell and break things because they were so caught up in their own craziness so you know, boundaries, yes, up to the couple, up to the individual, but there are certain things, at least for me, that are, are really black and white. And I think Tammy would agree that abuse is, uh, is definitely on that list. I, I do. And, you know, I, I often share what you shared earlier. Why would you have sex with somebody who you don't trust? So I think, I think that's kind of a don't have sex until you feel like you can trust. But Again, not everybody, you know, holds to that, but a hundred percent with the violence, emotional, physical abuse is you know, never okay. So, okay. Next question. Do you have any experience treating addicts on the autism spectrum? Are there ways you vary your treatment approach for these individuals? So I love this question because we work with it there. When we have someone come in, if someone comes into seeking integrity and they have this issue and they really want to work on it, we have a specialist that they can work with and we will direct those sessions, not all their sessions, but they will have time. Because I've had this come up before where, for example, a spouse says, you're so emotionally unavailable, you never wanna connect with me. And it sounds like all the other addicts, but actually they have a problem with connections because they, they didn't even know or they don't know how to manage the autism piece. So we do have an expert who works with that when someone is in treatment. Tammy also knows people who, will, who do workshops and stuff online for, I don't know if they talk about the sexuality, but certainly about negotiating intimacy related to the autism. I'm thinking of Candace. They can't, yeah, the woman. yeah, Candace I, has right. in, the, in the past. I don't know what she's doing, you know, as far as that yeah, goes she's now, still doing but it. I think she's still doing those. So yeah, yeah. So, so and yes, there are others do. as well. Yeah, so. Write Tammy, T-A-M-I, <laughs> at seekingintegrity.com. We get no kickbacks for making referrals, but we do know between the two of us with, I don't know, 35 years of experience in the field that I put us together, by the way, because you know? mm -hmm. um, I know you're, mm -hmm. I'm your teenager. Um, but we do have the experience to know, I'll tell you what, Tammy ran the training program for professionals for many year, years, and I did a lot of the training. So between the two of us, we really do know, I don't think it's just having a particular degree. I think it's really the person that you trust to know what they're doing. And anybody with a master's can go out and get a, a specific certification, but are they good at it? And do they know what they're doing or did they just want to add it to some letters after their name? Um, that's something that we do know. And I would write Tammy about it. And in the trainings, I used to say, we can make a good therapist, you know, have great skills with these particular issues, but we can't ever make a not good therapist. I went so far as to say bad therapist into a good one. So, so yeah, there's I'm a lot teaching of, therapists. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, there's a lot of therapists I will never refer to. And there's some that if I, you know, if I needed help, I'd go to them. So, so, you know, they're, you know, there's, yeah. yeah. Okay. Next question. I understand addicts lie. Is there a point in recovery that they stop? When? Oh, a point yeah, it, she, yeah. No, I was going to say, you yeah, have point to in start. recovery. Yeah, no, this is one of those. Abso absolutely. We're seeking integrity. So yes, we, we do learn, you know, I, I value integrity. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things I value, but, and it's all the stuff I learned in recovery um, uh, because I didn't have those skills. So, so yeah, I don't, 
I work really hard at not lying to myself because that's the first barrier where, you know, if I'm lying to myself, I can get all, you know, in, you know, I can get all tripped up on it, but, but it is in recovery. It isn't just in abstinence. It isn't in early recovery when it's just kind of sobriety and I'm just figuring all this out, but there's tools that we use and, you know, they are taught this in, you know, in our treatment program, but we talk about it other places too, like the 24 hour rule or a shorter period of time where, you know, but it's, what is the lie doing for, you know, for us? You know, is it, we're escaping from fear. We're afraid of your reaction. You know, we're lying to ourselves, whatever it is, we have to start to understand that when we start to understand why we're doing those particular things and that that isn't what we really want. We want true connection and we can't have that if we keep lying, you know, then we start to shift. And we'll come to you and say, you know, I'm sorry, I lied to you five minutes ago when I said that this is, I was afraid of your reaction, whatever. And this is, this is the truth. And lies of omission are just as bad as lies of commission. And people forget about that. They just go, well, I didn't say it. So still bad. So. Yeah, I wrote a whole bunch of stuff down. Um, the first thing I thought of Tammy is, is our 12 step is shared 12 step history. We, we didn't go through the process together, but it's the same process wherever you go. And you know, there's a very important piece that Tammy could probably quote better than I do, but basically it's in our literature for 12 step. And what it says is that almost anyone can get well as, you know, but there's a couple of provisions. One, they have to be committed to the process and really want it. And the other is they have to have the capacity to be honest doesn't mean they're going to be honest every time, but it does mean that they recognize or they come to recognize when they are not being honest and they get honest. And the reason for this is not to get you to be closer to me or to get you to love me or to get it to work out or to not leave you feeling I'm lying. Again, that's kind of backwards. The reason that I don't lie to you is because it will undermine everything I am trying to do. In addiction, we live, a, everything's a lie. And I can't even keep up with what I said to who and who thought I was going to be where, when. But in recovery, it's not just that I don't want to lie to the people I care about. I don't want to lie because of the burden it puts on me. And so I wanted to go back to some of the things that Tammy said, which is um, I may not always be completely honest with you, but I will recognize when I'm not being honest and I will come back and apologize and tell the truth. So I'll say a little different than Tammy. I don't know that I will ever stop entirely telling a lie in the particular set of circumstances. However, I do know what a lie looks like. I do know how it makes me feel. And I do know what it takes to clean it up. And that is not how, I, how it was before. Um, the, the, those 12-step programs have some good things to say, don't they, Tam? They are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And that's what it And is. others, right? No, it, no, it just is constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And there are such unfortunates. And right. that's the, the point is if I can't be honest with myself, I can't be honest with anybody else. So, so we, we have to learn and we have to be willing to look at things, even, you know, the, the yucky underbelly of well, who we are, but gosh, that is so freeing. That's, that's the gift of recovery is that we find out we're just like everybody else and we don't have to lie. We can, we can be truthful. So, well, actually, I think we have to make an extra effort more than yes. because the first thing that comes out of my mouth is going to be a lie unless I really think more consciously about it especially if there's something I want and I, and I want but, to get it but you know tell anybody. that's why I love people in recovery because tr people truly in recovery are working towards that you know and and I believe them I have reason to believe because it's part of their integrity as well so are we perfect heck no do we make mistakes heck yes but we have a, a plan and a program that helps us do so without having to relapse and go into shame so and we're going to make messes it's all about recognizing them and cleaning them up yes so let's keep going Okay, so you always say betrayed partners should not ask about the gory details from their partners, but unfortunately I discovered my partner's affairs by finding the gory details. I am so sorry. I hate that when it happens and it does 
unfortunately, a lot. Uh, sex videos that they made together, their sexual texting and new pics. Of course, I, it was traumatizing, but I still want a formal disclosure because there is still so much I don't know. My question is about how I can work toward healing and let go of the things I saw and continue to haunt me. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and thank you for asking this because I unfortunately hear this all the time where that's how you find out it's this discovery and it is, you know, like the, the, the gory details that are, you know, stuck in your head. So. Well, I, I just want to say, just as an aside, Tammy, you, you say all the time, you know, I get, I talk to people about this all the time. And the reason is, is because someone calls about a course, they talk to Tammy. If someone wants to go mm -hmm. to treatment, they talk to Tammy. If someone wants to have a consultation with me, they talk to Tammy because she is the center of our relationship. She is the center. And if we want to send someone to a therapist, it, it goes through Tammy. So she really holds, she's the hub of relationships, <laughs> holds the us together. And, uh, and so that's why Tammy will say, oh, well, I hear this all the time is because she's constantly taking calls from, and in fact, Tammy's the one who says, I think we need a group on that because a lot of people are talking about it. So anyway, uh, and, and she does consultations and all that. But anyway, um, into this particular thing, I am truly sorry because it would be very difficult to get that out of your head. And, um, and this isn't just an affair, it's icky. It's like pictures and videos and it's just icky. And so I guess one of the things that I wanna say with respect for the situation is I would not want you to do formal disclosure unless you had real support. This is a time to call Tammy and say, I need a therapist who really understands what a spouse needs to prepare for in order to do disclosure. Because unless you've managed and dealt with some of that trauma or you have support because it was, you just said it was traumatizing, it's all gonna come back when you do that disclosure in a way that might be completely overwhelming for you. And I don't want you handling the toughest experience of your life, perhaps, which is listening to that disclosure without knowing you have someone to talk to, some place to go, some, you know, some of the betrayed partners groups that they know you're going to have disclosure and you go back in the next day and you let them know, you know, uh, I just want to make sure. So um, perfectly fine to have it. But the last sentence tells me everything, which is how can I work toward healing and letting go of the things that I saw? That's therapy. That's trauma work. That's talking to other spouses. And, and actually, it's a lot of being really angry. This is a situation where there's going to be different boundaries, where you're going to be angrier because now you've been exposed. It isn't just something you knew or heard about, or maybe you saw something in someone's pocket. I mean, you saw the whole thing. And, and so that's going to require a whole bunch of different boundaries in your relationship than if you just learned about it. Um, so I understand the desire as we do, you know, if I get my questions answered, like in disclosure, then I can be at peace and feel better. Unfortunately, getting your questions answered may make you feel for a while a lot worse. How could I not have known about that kind of thing? Or they did that when we were on vacation, you know, those kinds of things. So you really need to be prepared. I will say one thing, please go, and I'll say this to all the spouses. Please go get STD tested. I cannot tell you how many people, this is my, my, I get a lot of calls, how many addicts I've worked with over the years, both at Seeking Integrity and in all the years I've been doing this treatment, who will say, oh, well, you can't get something from oral sex, or I knew they were safe because they they were mostly with me or, you know, whatever it is. And what they're not doing is protecting you and you have to protect you. So if you even have a hint of all this stuff, Addicts are thinking, well, I can't get this and I won't get that. And surely I'd know if I had this. You know, if you're a woman, you can get HPV, for example, that a man may never know he has, but in a woman can cause cer cervical cancer. So I don't mean to be so explicit, but I really, we lie. We lie a lot. And as Tammy said, we lie to ourselves. And I can't believe that I would ever do anything to hurt you physically. So that means I haven't. <laughs> and uh, I know you don't want to hear this. I know you don't want to hear it from me, but please protect yourself so you don't end up three years from now in a worse situation than, than you knew about. Um, so my answer is get support so that you can get uh, not be doing this process by yourself. And also, even if you don't do disclosure, get help with this haunting you. Yeah, the EMTR, brain spotting, all of those are, are very practical 
tools at just helping to take the physical reaction of, uh, away from the trauma. Um, and I, you know, like a formal therapeutic disclosure, if he actually has stopped all these problematic behaviors, if he's actually working on a recovery path, you know, then both of you having support to work towards that is great. But doing a formal therapeutic disclosure, I can't tell you again how often I hear, oh yeah, we did one of those, you know, a couple of years ago. And I mean, the, the cycle of those, because the addict never got the right amount of help to stop, you know, and to not, you know, relapse into this, the same kind of behavior. So you getting support for you, plan for the formal therapeutic disclosure, but having him have the right help in order to be able to show up really for for that, um, I, I'd encourage you for that, so. I just wanna say one more thing, which is, mm -hmm. you know, we're sitting here saying, and absolutely correctly, mm -hmm. how awful this is, how horrible mm -hmm. this is, you know, how overwhelming this is. But I want you all to know that there is no pain comparison. You know, it may be that my spouse was looking at porn and your spouse, I saw all these, and you saw all these pictures of your spouse, but your pain is your pain. And my pain is not worse or better than your pain or greater because I saw something that would, would have been tougher than what you saw. Pain is pain and every partner here is struggling with pain and there's no comparisons. Uh, it is what it is. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Okay. Uh, I'm, hi, Dr. Rob. I'm in the men's uh, porn a level one or porn addiction 101 level two group. And it has been mentioned that there's context of masturbation and sex that is not a human need, which seems contradictory to when people do suffer with sexual anorexia. It always helps me to think in terms of eating disorder that eating is a necessity. Can you help us understand if sex is a human need like food and water? Um, sex is not a human need like food or water. Um, if you don't have sex, you'll live. If you don't have food or water, you'll die. So it's very, very clear that in order to survive and be healthy as a human being, physically, you do not have to have sex. In fact, there are probably many spiritual religious people who really take their beliefs seriously who have never had sex and they seem to be doing perfectly fine. Um, it is a need, it's a need to have intimacy. It's a need to have relationship. It's a need to be in community. It, it is a, um, what's the word I wanna use? And also that I, I wanna say this is, um, this is a mixed question, right? Because um, I can be sexual with a partner and not masturbate. Um, being sexual is healthy and something I want in my life. And um, some people uh, that safe, if they're not, not an issue for them to do it through masturbation and also to be sexual with partners. But if we have a porn problem, we don't get to sit around and masturbate. It's just a problem for us. Um, does it mean we can't be sexual in other ways? No. Um, but those have to be, you know, discussed and worked out and that's what your meetings and your therapy is for. But, um, I, my question would be, okay, here's the deal. If you're in a porn 101 level two group, and those are some of the groups that we're talking about, um, you are not suffering from sexual anorexia or you wouldn't be in the group. So to me, you know, you have, you're having a problem with sex. You're having sex of some kind or you wouldn't be in this group. So you are clearly not the person who's suffering from anorexia or the lack of being sexual. To me, this feels a little bit like, well, what if it's the worst thing in the world? Then, you know, it doesn't sound like something you're asking for yourself. Um, oh, I is, think it is. To me, to me, this feels like, you know, I have sexual anorexia. I'm not having sex with other people. Oh, so. poor me. You think this is a poor so, me kind of no, thing? No, this is like, you know, it's just porn and masturbation, but to me, it enhances the sexual anorexia because I'm staying only with, like, I'm just having sex with myself. So I'm still not, you know, venturing out well, and we, dating and having sex with other people. We, That's don't, what I we don't know, to be mm -hmm. honest, because it does say, um, not basically, it says not masturbating and not being sexual um, seems contradictory to when people do suffer from anorexia. So anyway, it doesn't matter. The point is, is that if you're a sex addict or porn addict, you're not suffering from sexual anorexia. If you're a porn addict, you are lacking connection and emotional relationships and touch, but that doesn't mean it has to be sex. Um, so people with eating disorders are able to eat in a healthy way with boundaries. They don't just eat anything they want because uh, they have to eat. They eat the things and in a way that is consistent with their values and what's healthy for them. Uh, if you're a porn addict, it may not be consistent with where you are in your recovery to be masturbating. Um, 
is it consistent to per potentially start to be sexual with someone else or regain your sexuality with someone else? That's up to your sponsor, your therapist, you know, but sex is a healthy human. Uh, it's healthy and it's human and it's a part of who we are and we are meant to, uh, to pair bond and we're meant to, you know, try to have the little ones. I mean, that's part of what, that is why we're here on some level, either to support those little ones or to have them. Otherwise the whole race ends. And sex is a requirement in order to get those little ones here. But is it like food or water? No, because, you know, the planet will go on if I don't have sex. And by the way, to you men who say, and you do, well, isn't something bad going to happen if I don't have sex or orgasm? And the answer is no, your body will take care of itself. And if you need to have some kind of release of fluids, you will have what we used to call a nocturnal emission which used to happen when you were 12 or 13, maybe to some of you, because you weren't being sexual and your body was ready. So in the same way, if your body is really suffering from not having some kind of release, it will take care of itself. Um, so the answer is yes, you cannot, uh, you do not have to be sexual for long periods of time and you will be fine. And that is healthy, perhaps until you are able to engage in healthy sex, in which case you might reclaim it, but certainly not the beginning. So by the, I'm going to say this again, Pammy, to me, this feels like I want to prove my point around what I can have and what I can have, because what about this? And, you know, it's not an eating disorder. Not, it feels like someone is searching for the answer they want and giving comparisons rather than saying, because there isn't a, this is what I do. This is what I'm dealing with. It's sort of like these ideas of well, what if I was there? What are, so I don't fully trust this question, but it's a good one. I, I'm with you. I'm looking for the loophole of like, well, you know, yes. okay. Okay. So the next question, my wife recently found out about my infidelity with a sex worker in 2019. It happened twice with the same sex worker. There has been full disclosure and I'm dedicated to trying to repair my marriage while my wife tries to determine if she wants to stay in the marriage. I use porn occasionally, not frequently in my opinion. And these two times were the only times I've done this. I did look at an escort website in 2016 and my wife found out about that as well. So there was already damage we were dealing with. At that time, I was intrigued with the idea of a sex worker as this is all pretty fresh. I'm looking inward at myself to determine why and what drove me to those behaviors. And I'm trying to determine if I have an addiction. I'm very confused because to me, an addiction is compulsive and chronic behavior. Thank you for your time. I've already read Out of the Doghouse and my wife and I have listened to several of the chapters together. It's very helpful. Well, you know, Tammy, if you don't mind, I'd love you to start, not that I have an answer, but I'd love your thoughts about this one because it's a very good question. Very good. It, it is. And, and, I, and I don't, you know, like if truly that is, is you know, all was it you know i mean out of the doghouse we have a work group on on the seeking integrity site and it's for men who have been caught cheating and not all of them identify as addicts in fact most of them well i don't know i guess i'd have to ask the facilitator jason about what most of them do but no the doghouse is them, for men who cheat, cheat or right. men who are addicts yeah Right. And so there's a number of them that are in that work group that don't identify as a sex right. addict or a porn addict or really having other, you know, you know, gaming or gambling or whatever, you know, compulsive behaviors. Did you make a mistake? Yeah. Did you betray your wife? Yeah. Did you, you know, did you hurt her deeply? Yes. You know, um, um, but that, that, so there isn't, I mean, you can, you know, you can go online on our uh, Seeking Integrity site. We've got a, a quick little self quiz to, to kind of get an idea of whether you identify as an addict or not. But at the end of the day, you guys are struggling with this cheating behavior. It's problematic. And how do you repair you know, the, the damage that has been done? So, Well, the only question I have is this sentence about I've used porn occasionally, not frequently, in my opinion. So that's probably something I'd want to put down on a piece of paper and talk about someone with. But here's the reality. You are absolutely right that in order to have addiction, it has to be compulsive. It has to be chronic. Um, and quite honestly, there are people come to see me and they're, oh, well, that just started when I was 35. Mm -hmm. We usually, when we really start digging, it started a lot earlier in various ways. I will say this. I wrote this down and maybe it's true for you. Maybe it isn't. But for a spouse, it's easier to say you're an addict in some level, because if they have to look at that, you chose to be with someone else, that you chose to hire someone, it's much harder on them 
emotionally on some level than to say, oh, they have a problem. Because you have a problem, it's not as related to me. If you decided to go out and have an affair or see sex workers or you know whatever all that is, that is more about us because it's not your problem. It's something that you chose to do that involves us. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but I think, and I'm going to put it both ways. I think some spouses are more comfortable using the word addiction because it's kind of over there, um, at least for a while. I think there are addicts, uh, there are cheaters who, well, there are addicts who use the word addiction or people who, cheaters, sorry. There are cheaters who use the word addiction as an excuse which is, you know, oh, well, I couldn't help myself. I'm an addict, you know? So it can be misapplied both ways, but I really, and here's a great way to find out if you're an addict. Um, first of all, stop your behavior. If there's nothing, you know, mm -hmm. if you can do it and it's not happened mm -hmm. for a year or two, you're probably not an addict. But uh, back to the, the last thing I wanna say, Out of the Doghouse is a book that was written for anyone who is any man who has cheated on a woman. It was not written for any male sex addict. It was written for any man who's cheated on a woman, cheated. So Doghouse would make absolute sense because it was written for you and it was written for you and your spouse because it's about men who cheat, but it's not necessarily about addiction in really. So if you're reading it, um, that and it fits, that doesn't mean that we're talking about addiction. It means we're talking about, about betrayal. Out of the doghouse is about what happens when someone you deeply love is someone you've also betrayed and you don't know how to fix it. It's an explanation about how to fix it because men don't really understand that. But it isn't a validation that you're an addict. Um, addicts have compulsive chronic behaviors that cause them, well, I'll give you the definition of addiction. Uh, one, you've had consequences from it and you're still doing it. Two, it's an obsession and you're constantly going back to it. and Three, um, what's the third one? I'm sorry, you can't stop despite consequences. It's a, it's an obsession and focus of your life. Um, give me the third one, Tammy. Um, I'm sorry, I was typing an answer to somebody else because we aren't going to get to it. That's okay. So. I'm thinking of the three signs of addiction I've been writing so much lately. Compulsive, one is you've had secrets. Okay, right. yeah. lies and secrets. Compulsive, you, 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 um, you can't stop. And, well, and I really think if I'm using it to numb out if i'm using it to escape you know if there's it's not just compulsive but i'm using it for like food if i'm running to the pantry because i'm uncomfortable you know that you know that's a problem for me too for so. you because you have eating issues but yeah I think but, for but it doesn't else, matter like it's gaming if it whatever it is that i'm looking well, to change my feelings by doing whatever it is i'm doing you know and i want to validate date that but also say that doesn't mean addiction because mm -hmm. my mother could die and i could be incredibly overwhelmed well and the that's way a I situation cope, yeah the way I, right so if it's situated perfect time so if it's situational you know um and you act out in a certain way during a certain period of time and i think you're asking the right question why did that happen then and you know why what was going on with you i mean those are things that i would examine if i wasn't an addict if I was an addict, I don't think it matters what was going on with you. You're going to do it no matter what's going on with you. So I think this is a very good question, and I think time will tell. Um, and I, you know, again, as I said, for some partners, it's just easier to say there's something wrong with you than we weren't doing well and you stepped out on me. Um, yeah. Okay. I've got the, so. Let's do I one more. Okay. No, and there's like three really good. So I'm the betrayer. I know what we can. And we have I'm very, I know I'm the betrayer and very interested in a formal disclosure with my betrayed partner. How can I tell if my CSAT is properly trained and is going to be helpful to me and also sensitive to my betrayed partner? So hopefully really your betrayed partner question. has a has their own therapist. So so ask them how many um, disclosures, formal disclosures they've done, how they work in tandem with the betrayed partner's uh, support person. Um, do they understand pro-dependence or are they doing codependence? I mean, I, I would talk to them about, you know, what they do and what they don't do. Um, uh, th there are some podcasts on sexandrelationshiphealing.com that talk about that. We answer questions about disclosure a lot. In fact, Debbie McRae did a, 
really good series. Um, they're on the previously recorded webinars under the resource tab on, you know, on the sex and relationship healing.com site. And she talked about what a process is and they do lots of them. So um, this is not somebody that you want. I mean, you did say CSET, so that's good. This is not somebody you want a general therapist that doesn't know, but it's really, you're the betrayer, like you being able to show up and have accountability for what you're, that you are well prepared, that you have your timeline, you know, that, you know, that you're able to do your work and hold um, the accountability with your therapist. And then again, your partner having their therapist, so that supporting your partner through the process so that they're prepared, have a plan, you know, what is the whole plan show how you show up it's two separate cars what is the plan for afterwards well, you know separate place so yeah and i know i'm sorry tammy just because we're almost out of time yeah. um it is a very clear process it is not 12 pages it may be one or two um it is the facts it's not an apology it's not a please forgive me it's not i wouldn't have done this had i known i was an addict it's just the facts this is not an apology this is a i you need to know what you haven't known and i'm going to let you know or tell you so that we're both dealing with the same facts. But what I didn't hear here is that my partner has their own person that they're seeing. And if you have the resources at all, I think it's a problem when, for example, if your partner's in therapy, but they're not seeing someone who's trained in this, and we do a therapist uh, supervision or consultation every week. And I often hear from, from CSATs, I'm working with her and we're working on disclosure. He's seeing someone who isn't a CSAT and they don't understand what we're doing. Um, so, you know, or she wants disclosure and his therapist says, I don't know what you're talking about. I think that at least for this period of time, it's really helpful if both people you're working, if you're working with two people and if both of them really have some clue, because we therapists, we struggle with, well, don't do it that way. You got to do it my way because that's your client. And I can't tell you what's right for your client, but if we're doing the same process on either side, you want to have someone who understands both sides and preferably one for each. This is not cheap. Treatment is not cheap, unfortunately. And I want you to know, please, the reason we do the podcast, the reason we do all of this free stuff, at least in my heart, is for all the people who don't have the resources and the money to get the support, to build these relationships. Some of you have three jobs and you don't have time to go to a support group, but all this information is available and it is on sex and relationship healing, there is no cost, you know, we do have things that we charge for, but not all of this free support. And uh, I hope your partner is getting the information that will tell uh, him or her how to feel safe in this process and how to take care of themselves. Um, disclosure is a very clear thing that should be done in a very clear way at a certain period of time. Um, and it isn't rocket science, but a lot of people seem to think that a lot of people well, seem I'm pretty gonna, cool with this. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? Like, so Dr. Rob does a, a weekly peer case consultation group for professionals who do this work. The number one topic that comes up within the peers mm -hmm. who do these is disclosure, formal therapeutic disclosure. How do they support their clients? the partner or the addict in this so when the when the professionals are talking about this i say this all the time it's not a diy project don't you know don't do this on your own so, so getting the right support taking the time to do it right do it once not have the have the repeating circle of of disclosures it's so painful for both of you you don't need that be on the positive recovery journey so and I will say one more thing, Tammy, because we take a lot of time with it, is that the gold star referrals that we make, the diamond referrals, are people who are sitting with us every single week and talking about cases. Um, it's, they, we don't charge them either. They're there free. And I think, you know, about 35 therapists come and go, but there's a, a solid group of about 25 who are there every single week for a year or two because they want to keep learning about this from each other and from me. So, you know, we, again, Tammy at SeekingIntegrity.com, we do have a good clue about who's doing good work and there is no charge for us to refer. But Tammy, I just want to say thank you. It's good to see thank you. Thank you. Yes. Did you know your clothes match on. all of the... Did you I did. I actually, all I actually of the logos? thought of that because I do like, I like orange a lot, this color orange, good, and I do well like navy, done. and I was like... I'm going to look like the logo today. So, well yes, done. so I'm yes. going to go eat some of those groceries I bought. I'm going to go to the gym. Yeah. And if you're seeking integrity, I will see you tomorrow. All right. Bye Talk everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Tammy.